Okay, so we're now recording. And we are recording uh, items from right now, quiz seven. Is specifically questions two and three. I think that this is uh, a scrambled set of questions at Amari, so I may need your help with, in terms of the context of the questions. So I'm opening the quiz right now. So let me share that. So my question two is about these uh, these curves. Is that correct, Adamari? Mm, no. I sent it in the chat. It starts with the cholesterol levels of an adult. Can be described right. by normal model. Mm -hmm. So it's about the cholesterol level problem? Yeah. There we go. So notice how they ask you about the cholesterol level of adults. So I'm gonna go back to make a board out of it. And rather than using my numbers, I'm gonna use your numbers. Okay. Does that make sense? So this is the cholesterol level, the cholesterol level probability question in the quiz. And in your case, what is the average level of cholesterol? 184. Okay, and what is the deviation? 25. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is draw the model for this problem. And we say that this model has a normal distribution. So what that means is that the shape of the model is that the probabilities increase as long as you're heading towards the average value and then the probabilities decrease in a symmetrical fashion with respect to the values of cholesterol. And we can also look at this in standard deviation units. So we're going to call these milligrams per deciliter of blood. And then we're going to call these z-scores. And then the scale in z-score units starts at uh, minus 3. and goes as far as three deviations right of the mean. And in, 
in terms of cholesterol levels. The first number, when a number is three deviations below the average, it is 75 points below the average. And that's 109. If it's two deviations below the average, it's 50 points below 184. If it's one deviation below the average, it's 25 points below 184. The average is the average. One deviation above average is 209 points. Two deviations below average is another 25 points to that. And another 25 points beyond that is 259. Does that make sense so far? I'm sorry? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. So now I'm going to basically carve out this normal model. I like to think of these bell curves as muffin tops, and I'm basically making some cuts through a muffin top. And the cuts are going to go at each deviation from the mean, from the center. So if that's the middle, then one deviation from the middle is down to 159 and up to 209. And then uh, two deviations uh, would be at 134 and three deviations would be at 109 below average and above average you have the same 234 and 259. That makes sense so far? And then I'm going to color some areas here. I'm going to color the middle part in yellow, and that's 68% of the model. Then I'm going to put uh, stars all over second portion of the curve. And when I add up the area covered in stars with the area in yellow, that's 95% of the model because that's two deviations from the mean. And then I'm going to cover the tiniest area in little hearts. And then the unusual stuff is beyond three deviations from the mean. Because uh, back in chapter three, we said that things that are within one deviation of the mean are called common. So these things are normal and they make up 68% of the curve. If you're looking at things that are two deviations from the mean, those are uncommon. So we call this usual. We 
call these unusual. And then if we're looking at uh, the region that covers the hearts, the stars, and the white, that area of three deviations, that's 99.7%. And then this zone here is called very unusual. So these values here are called very unusual. So somebody with a cholesterol level of 110 has an, a, a very unusually low cholesterol. Somebody with a cholesterol reading of 240 is somebody who has a very unusual high cholesterol level. Okay, and that's 99.7%. And the, these people are called very unusual. And these people are also called very unusual. So, to get results based on this table, whether it's percentages, areas, or values, what we do in this problem is operate stat, calculators, normal, and we're gonna set the mean to 184, and we're gonna set the standard deviation to 25. And then we can uh, go ahead and use the calculator. So what is uh, what are the questions in your in your problem? Like what percentage of adults have cholesterol levels over what? What was your part A question? Or part B, sorry. Part A was the which is the bell curve of choice. But part B, what is part B in your problem? Uh, 190. Cool. Yeah. And so basically what you're interested in is to find the area that's covered over 190. So you're basically wanting from about here all the way to the right. All the way to the right. So you want an area you want this area here from 190 all the way to the right. That and so to, do, to use the calculator, the way we use the calculator in that case is, uh, let me go open it. Notice that the question actually has a, a question help that has stat crunch active in it.
I somehow managed to close my my Chrome. So it's reopening. So Adamari, can you go to your screen and open StatCrunch? Have you been able to open StatCrunch? Yeah, I have it open. Okay, so go stat calculators normal. Yes, I'm there. And then set the uh, set the mean to 184. Okay. The standard deviation to 25. And then at the bottom where it says x is greater than or equals to or s x is less than or equals to zero. Then you switch that to X is greater than one nine zero. Okay. And uh, you should get an area like 30 some percent or 20 some percent. Point uh, point 40, 51. Cool. So that's the answer to part B. Then it says in percent, can I just put 40% or do I have to? Uh, correct, 40 point something percent, whatever the, the relevant percentage would be. I got 186 and 29. Okay, and then you, you just put in your X is greater than 210 in your case and you're done. For B? If that's what you're working on, sir, yes. Okay. But for A, with the normal calculator, how are we supposed to get the curve? I described the curve in the board. Do you remember the board? Yeah, but it's gone. Oh, yes, of course. But that, but you, I mean, my numbers are 184 and 25. So notice how my center is 184. Your center is not going to be that if, if you it's have 186. Numbers, right? And then you just go every every 25 units above and below that. And that marks each and every one of the values that I'm highlighting that I'm boxing here. Mm, okay. So you, that's how you know which is the right model. You can also just look at your stat crunch calculator. And for part C, we have to know what percent of adults we would expect to have cholesterol between between the, those two numbers. In my case, it's 130 and 160 milligrams. So you just change the calculator to between mode and do it. Right. So, Ada Marie, when we were covering um, this, the normal calculator in StatCrunch, I'm trying to open StatCrunch now. Okay. 
So notice how my model now, my center now is 197 plus or minus 27. So every 27 units, every 27 units below and above is one more standard deviation, which covers either 68%, 95%, or 99.7%. And then here I have levels over 200 and here I have between 150 and 170. And so what I'm going to do to find those, I hope that this doesn't blow up. Mm. I'm opening stat crunch. So I, again, you just go stat calculators normal. You set your mean and your deviation to whatever your numbers are. I think you said yours were Adam Murray 184 and 25. And so then when you say greater than 190 is 0.405, right? And then when you want to calculate, uh, if you click on this button here that says 68, 95, 99.7, it creates the scale that is the right scale for part A. Okay. Are you on stack crunch? Okay. So when you click on this button, usually the scale looks weird like this. But if you press this button that says 68, 99.7, you get the scale done one, two, and three deviations from the mean. So that's how you do part A. Part B, you would set the calculator to greater than 190. Part C, you have to change from standard to between. And then you put the low value, whatever the low value is, and whatever the high value is. And then you get an area. Okay. I don't know what your low and high are, but that's, that's for part C. Okay, yeah, I get it. Thanks. Okay. Then for part D, it's a little different because for part D, they want you to estimate the inner quartile range. The inner quartile range is the middle half of the data because it's from quartile three to quartile one. In other words, whatever this is and whatever this is, are gonna be quartile three and quartile one of the data. And so the, the percentage of data values between the two quartiles, which are currently unknown, is 50%, because half the data is inside of the interquartile range. So then to figure out the answer for the IQR, the IQR equals Q3 minus Q1. So you have to do 200 minus 167, which is 33. So your IQR is 33. Okay. I got so, 39. So figuring out the, it varies depending on what the standard deviation is. So everybody's will be different. And then uh, part D, Sorry, part D was the IQR. Part E. Part E is the highest 15%. What are the cholesterol levels? And so for that, you have to switch back to the standard mode for part E. And then you have to change this 40% to 15%. And people who have cholesterol readings of 210 or higher are the people who are in the highest 
So this 15% is this red part here. And the cutoff value is the cholesterol level in question. So these are just applications along the same pattern as what you did in lab seven when you were learning how to open a normal calculator. And then in, in, in lab seven, we did a lot of exercises where we left the mean and the deviation alone. And we looked at, for example, the middle, the middle half, for example. So that's the middle half. Notice how it looks just like the model here, except that the model on the right is in cholesterol units, not in standard deviation, not in z-score units. The left one is in z-scores, the right one is in standard deviations, in uh, cholesterol units, pardon me. The left one is in standard deviations. And so when you're interested in the top 15% of values, the above this, you could have also gone here to standard and gotten the top 15% of values. And that's about a little more than one deviation right of center. So it's 1.04 standard deviations above the mean. Since your mean is 184, and your deviation is 25, Twenty-six milligrams above one eighty-four is two hundred and ten. Which is that? I don't know if seeing the two graphs helps understand the connection between Z scores and milligrams of cholesterol. But did that help answer the question and sort of get the idea right, uh, Mari? Yeah. Okay. What was the other question in the quiz that was? tricking you uh it was your question too the one you showed first the every normal model is defined cool. by its parameters mm -hmm. so in that question what's happening is the following you have something to find so sometimes you're interested in finding the standard deviation other times you're interested in finding the mean and we have a connection between all those all those things. So some again, some some things are given to you in each problem. And then there's some unknowns. And usually the unknowns are the standard deviation. That's what they mean by find the missing parameter. So in, in part A and B, the missing parameter is the standard deviation of the model. And in part C and D, the missing parameter is the mean. Okay. And the, the key to solving this problem is that every normal model is defined in terms of the mean and the standard deviation. So if you know the mean and the deviation of a normal model, then you can kind of figure everything else out about it. So when we go back to our whiteboard here, notice how the moment we figured out the mean and the standard deviation and the cholesterol problem, we could set up this entire model here, this entire normal model of probability. Okay. And the key in problem two is the following. It's the connection
the connection between the z-score and the x values. Okay, and the connection is the following. We know from chapter three that a z-score requires that you find the, a specific value of x and you compare it to the mean and that you then divide that by the standard deviation of x. So that's the formula from chapter three of how to find the z-score. Okay. And this formula has four parts. B, X, the mean of X, and the standard deviation of X. And from algebra, I know that if, uh, if I know three parts, then the fourth one is uh, something I can figure out with algebra. Does that make sense so far? If I know three of these four ingredients, the fourth one, I can just rearrange the expression. Okay. So that's what I'm going to do in the next board here. So this is quiz seven. Find the missing parameter. Question two. Which could be the mean is what we don't know. Or the standard deviation is what we don't know. And the key again to find this is uh, we know the z-score of a data set is when you compare x to the mean of x in standard deviation units of x. We divide the top by the bottom. So what do I need to know if I don't know the mean of x? If I don't know the mean of x, I need to be able to take x, subtract from it the product of the z-score times the standard deviation of x. And if I don't know the standard deviation of x, I need to know how a specific number is different from its mean and divide that by the z-score. So those are all, these two formulas are just re-expressions of the first formula. Does that make sense or not? Yes. I just did algebra on this. Adamari, did that make sense to you? That I'm just reshuffling the same equation? Yeah. Okay. So, in parts A and B of the problem, I don't know the standard deviation. So I have to be given information for x, the mean of x, and z-score. And in part C and D, I don't know the mean of X. So I need X, the standard deviation of X and Z. So 
So what is, what are the common elements of both problems, of both sets of parts? The common elements are that they all have a given x and a given z. And what varies is uh, what else is given. And the special part is how you figure out the z-score. The way you figure out the z-score is you use stat crunch. Mm -hmm. So you use the normal calculator to figure out z. in all four parts. That's what we're going to do next. Um, do me a favor, Adamari. Can you give me part A in your problem? What what they what do they give you information wise in part A? My guess is we'll be using Stat Crunch for these problems, eh? That's the point over here. That is that's exactly where we're headed here. Or do you want me to use my parts? Yeah, you can use your numbers. Cool. Let's figure it out. Okay, so I'm gonna, going back to my quiz. You good so far? So here's what they gave me. They gave me that the mean is 1450. And that 30% of the graph is below 1400. And they want me to figure out what the standard deviation of x is. So that's the, that's the first part here. Since I want to figure out, since what I don't know is the standard deviation, I'm going to use this formula to figure that out. So what is the standard deviation? According to this, the missing link here is I have to take x minus the mean of x and divide it by z. That, that formula, I'm just moving there. So now let me substitute. What is x here? x is 1400. Because that's what uh, the area below is, 1400. What is the mean of x? The mean of x is 1450. So notice how they gave me the first two parts here, x and the mean of x. And I still have to figure out the z-score. But I think now that the z-score, the magic z-score, breaks out 30% below 1,400. Okay, so in part A, in 
in part A, I'm going to look for a z-score that cuts out the bottom 30%. So that's the z-score I'm looking for. So to do that, I have to go to stat crunch. I have to go to stat, calculators, normal. I have to set the mode to between. No, I have to set the mode to standard, standard mode, because there's only one cut. Between mode means two different cuts. Leave the mean at zero. Leave the standard deviation at one. So leave those two alone. And then go down to the statement and make sure that the word below tells you that you're going to set the calculator to a less than or equals sign. And 30% means that you're going to change the area to 30%, to 0 0.3. And then you're going to compute. And the A result is going to give you Z. So that's what you have to do to get Z. And once you have Z, you have the standard deviation. So let me go open StatCrunch. And let me go Stat Calculators Normal. And the calculator already comes in standard mode. It already comes pointing to the less than, to the below area. And all I need to do is change this to 0.3, to 30%. And as you can see, this graph is very similar to the one that I sketched. And it has a z-score of minus, point, minus So that is what goes in here. And when I divide negative 50 by minus 0.52, I get like 105 or something like that. So this is just dividing minus 50 by minus 0.5244. Uh, it's a 95.3. And the graph looks like that one. I just opened up the normal calculator, Alan. Um, were we just about to do part B? Uh, part A, all you do every time is use the normal calculator just to find the z-score in every part. I wasn't going to do the whole problem because I, it's in the several of the past recordings. And uh, but you know I can I can do part C for example just to show a different part. Um, okay, 
So if you follow this board for parts A and B and for parts C and D, like for example, for part C, they give you the standard deviation They tell you that the standard deviation of X is 0.8 and that 99% of the graph is above 14. And then they ask you, um, what is the mean of X? And so just like before, This is the formula for the mean of X. So that's the formula that you're gonna use to solve for this. Alan. Okay. And then you just put in the parts. The mean of X is equal to the value of X minus the product of z score times the standard deviation of x. So x in this case is the 14 minus z score times the standard deviation. And the way you find the z-score is you put it in the bell curve. So the z-score has to be that 99% of the model is above it. So when you draw a bell curve, you want a value of z like that, because you want 99% of the model to be above it. So you want this green zone here. To be 99% of the curve above it. And the X value here is 14. And what you're trying to figure out is what's the mean. And you know that the deviation is 0.8. So so then you just need to know what the z-score is. What is the z-score of, of 14? So this is 14 minus negative 2.33 times 0 0.8. And you might be asking, how the heck did I get minus 2.33? I got that as the z-score of 99% above the marker. So the way you get that is you go to StatCrunch, you look above a certain marker, and you want to cover an area of 99%. So you put the area on the right-hand side and you get the 2.33 negative on that side. So, so you always use the normal calculator to find the ingredient, the z-score of a formula. And then you just do the math on Do the math on that equation. What did you get for the standard deviation of A and how? I'm trying to figure that out still.
Okay. So Sam, what is your part A? I got a mean of 1,000, 25% below 900. And the standard deviation is missing. 29% is above 900? Below 900. Okay, so that is very important, okay? That word below is very important because what it means is that when you're looking visually at the storyline, you really have two sets of axes. You have an axis in units. That's the axis we call X. And then you okay. have another axis, and the axis, the other axis is in standard deviation units. Hmm. So that one's in blue. All right. And you have the bell curve. Just like what's shown. And then a thousand is the mean. Yes. One thousand is the mean. That, by the way, is the location that has a z-score of zero. Because the mean always is at the center of the range. And then a quarter of the data is below. A quarter is below 900. So if I follow the logic there, then I can make a cutoff point right about here. And this is going to be a quarter. This is going to be an area of one quarter. Indeed. We're talking about that. That's a quarter. And that is below That's below 900. And so the one thing I do not know here is the z-score for that value. And what I'm trying to figure out is the standard deviation. So what I, my, my problem is about finding the standard deviation. And that is equal to taking a value of x, comparing it to the mean, and dividing by the z-score. That's the re-expression of the formula in question. And so I'm taking 900 minus 1,000 and dividing it by whatever the z-score is that I find here. And that z-score is going to be minus 0 0.67. And the way you find that is by using the calculator. The way you find that is you use stat calculators normal. OK. And you just, the mode of the calculator is standard. Not just between. like always. No, not always. Sometimes you need two numbers because sometimes you need a middle value. That's in this for the problem, between all value. Four parts, in this problem, all four parts are standard, but not in every problem. The last half of that, of that then, question goes between. And then the word below means you set the sign of the... Less than or equal to. The word below means that you set the sign to it's 
So less than or equal to. Equals to. And then the area, this is really important, the area is 0 0.25. And when you click on compute, you're going to get the z-score is less than or equal to minus 0 0.67. A question. And then you do the math here. You do the simple arithmetic. Yes? Uh, I just remember understanding like, is this just like you're just kind of rearranging the formulas that you use in calculus, right? Like, I'm just, I I'm just taking the z-score. But I just I'm want, saying, I'm trying to, I think I see like some kind of like familiarity with this, but I just don't know if it's like hmm. accurate. Yeah, this is just the z-score formula. Yeah, okay. Okay, and then we're saying, we're saying, hey, um, we're saying, I, I know x, I know the mean of x, and I don't know, I don't know the standard deviation. So I better I better find out I better find out what the z score is because if I don't find the z score out I'll never be able to solve for this. And once I do find the z score, then I can proceed to solving for the standard deviation in this fashion. And I get a uh, that the in this case the standard the standard deviation is roughly 150 or so. That's how I know what a standard deviation is, 150. Think about it this way. If I go 150 points backwards, if I go minus 150 points, Where am I going to get to? Uh, I'm going to get to, I'm going to get to 850. Because from 1,000, if I go backwards by 150, I get to 850. But I'm at 900. X is 900. And a quarter of X is below 900. So what's the only number that can do that? What's the only z-score that can do that? The only z-score that can do that is minus 0 0.67. Okay. The standard deviation, though, isn't 150, is it? Well, you'll have to do the math on minus 100 divided by minus 0.67, because you should be able to do that. I can't, I can't, well, there's not enough time in the world for me to do every part of every question in this level of detail. So if I do minus 100, and I divide that by minus 0 0.67, I get minus, I get 149 and a quarter. So that's the exact answer. Okay. 149 and a quarter. That's why I put here 150 or so. Because I'm trusting that you can just plug into your data compute expression or a calculator to get the, the exact answer. Okay. Let's see now. So we've done some problems in quiz seven. We've done the problem in exam 2A. Let's move on to exam. Oh, Ian has a question on quiz seven too. So since we're here, uh, then we'll proceed to the exam three in a moment. Um, Ian, do you wanna tell me about the question in, in quiz seven that you're interested in? 
question six in your case. Hey, Ian, you in? I think Ian left. I don't see him on the list of people who are here. So let me can we go going. over? Can we go over problem one, the bicycle one on quiz seven? Yep, Ian's gone. Okay, let's see. Um, I think like Alan, you post the bicycle ones. Um, on yeah, that's posted already. But I'll I'll go over it real quickly. Oh, okay. Um, so this is the bicycle problem. In my case, it's question three. So what this problem tells you, what this is an example of, this is an example of what we call the compound model. Because you're compound, compounding how long it takes to unpack a bicycle from its box, assemble it, and then tune it so that you can deliver a quality product to your customer. So in this case, the time it takes to pack a bike relates to these three ingredients. The time it takes to, to deliver a bike, sorry, the time it takes to deliver a bicycle is the unpacking time plus the assembly time plus the tuning time. And so numerically, what we're gonna be doing here is simply just adding that adding the average time of each component time to get the average of the whole thing. And to get the standard deviation, we're gonna to need to take the square root of the variance. And the variance is the variance of each component And the way we solve this in StatCrunch, in StatCrunch we use the following expressions. We use the sum of the mean. And in this case, we take uh, the square root of the sum of the square deviations. Using stack crunch, I can't see it. And then in this problem here, you want to calculate the probability that the time it takes to assemble a bicycle is below 30 minutes. in order to answer this question. So this is a normal probability. Where you set the mean to part A and the standard deviation to part A. And then you set the calculator into standard mode. And you set uh, x to be less than or equals to 30. And then you click on compute. Okay. Let me go ahead and do that real quick. Is that all right by you? Yeah. Is this Ariana? Cool. Okay. So basically, the, my first step is I'm going to move this data to StatCrunch so that I can use these formulas to calculate the mean and the standard deviation of the compound model of the three parts together. And then I'm going to calculate how, what is the chance that I'm able to put together the whole bike and assemble it and tune it in less than 30 minutes. Because I want to find out if, uh, 
if I if I believe the manager. So far, so good? Yeah. All right, let's do that then. So I'm going to go click here and open in Sat Crunch. It has been opened. And now, um, now Ariana, I'm, I'm gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do the formulas for this, mm -hmm. and put it all in to this board here of StatCrunch. That way you can take a photo of it and then apply it to your case. Oh, okay. So you can, you can have, if you have your phone ready or if you wanna take screenshots of this screen, that'd be, that'd be a good way to handle this. So first I'm gonna to go to data, yeah. compute. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna not compute one expression at a time, I'm gonna do both expressions. So I'm gonna go data compute multiple expressions. And uh, I'm going to compute the mean, variance, and the standard deviation. And the mean is the sum of the column called the mean with a capital M. So this mean here with a capital M is different than this mean here with a small m. The software will be able to recognize the column called mean as different from this. The variance is just the sum of the deviations squared. And the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. So I separated the second calculation into two parts. I separated the square rooting and the adding. This last equation here, the second equation here, requires that the three components of assembling unpacking and tuning be independent from one another. Okay, so when you hit compute, you'll see three more calculations there in your data table. And those three come from those three come from here. So after you hit compute, you will see three new columns added. And those are the three new columns added. Then for the second stage, you're gonna go stat calculators normal. And you're gonna take the mean with a little m and the standard deviation with a little sd. And you're gonna measure the time under 30 minutes. And then you're going to click on this button, the 6895 99.7 button, to have the scale done one deviation, two deviations, three deviations. And so what you get is that there's a little more than 1% chance that a store can finish a bike in less than 30 minutes. If the chance is small, then... Do you think that can only mean it will not be set up and ready to go as promised? Correct. So there's a 1.2% chance the bike will be ready. In 30 minutes or under. So if somebody tells you, hey, X is going to happen with a 1.2% chance, then the question is, do you believe that X will happen in 
um, typically that's too low of a chance for you to say that that's going to happen because what's probably going to happen is a compliment the 98.8 percent chance of happening okay. so that's how you then go back to the mean is 38.4 the standard deviation is 3.7 You got to round to two decimal places in the question. Okay. So in your case, it would probably be 3.76, um, I think, is what it said on your table. And again, I'm not being precise because and then over here, I put uh, 0 0.012. And so there is no, there, it's probably not likely that your bike will be ready then. So far, so good? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to shift a little bit. I'm going to go now to lab 10. And then I'll come back to exam three. Because okay. I've covered every question that you guys have put on the system. In terms of lab seven, quiz seven. So I'm going to go to lab 10. I'm going to go to Jian questions six and seven in lab 10. And this refers back to our first board in our board work. I also want you to notice before I move there that, um, that this lab, lab 10, has 28 points. So it has 10 extra credit points built in. So let's read the question first. I'm going back to board number one. So what we're doing now is doing something called a hypothesis test. And a hypothesis test takes seven steps to complete. So we're gonna use this board in this question and we're going to go to the last board here. And this is uh, based on board number one. And this is uh, lab 10. I think it's question six, as I recall, right? Yes. So that's the question. It says, a statistics professor has observed that for several years, about 11% of students who initially enroll in his stats class drop the class. Okay. So all this basically boils down to saying that P is 0 0.11. And that this is what we call the null hypothesis. A salesman suggests that he try a statistics software package that gets students more involved in with computers, predicting that it will cut the dropout rate. So what this means is that P is less than 0 0.11, because if fewer students are going to drop, then the rate should be less than 11%, not 11%. And this is what we call the alternative hypothesis. So 
So they give the professor a license for this software to try out if this is, if this uh, is true, if the software will make fewer students drop the class. And initially 186 students signed up for the class. So that's, a, that's what we call the number of, of observed students. And only 10 dropped the class. And this is what we would call the value of X the number of successes, so to speak, the number of people who dropped the class. Okay. So I know the null hypothesis. I know the alternative hypothesis, and I know what the data says. Now let me read part A. Determine the hypotheses for this test. So it's equal versus less than. So did you guys see where I got equals versus less than? Especially Jiang, because you asked this. Okay, so let's move on to the second part. It says compute the test statistic. So what is that referring to? By the yeast score? No, just the test statistic. So the test statistic is when you compare the observed proportion to the hypothesis proportion. In standard deviation units. So the test statistic was defined as how different is the data from the null hypothesis. How different are data and null hypothesis? That's what you're measuring right now. Because what you, the null hypothesis is what you believe. And the data is what you see. And so you have to compare seeing versus believing. But you have to do that in standard deviation units. Okay. And so the way to do that is really simple. Instead of you doing all the math, you go to stat. Portion statistics, one sample, summary, you enter the data, so you enter the sample size and the number of successes. You enter 183 and 10. So 183 is the number of observations, 10 is the number of successes. I think you enter them in reverse order than I listed them here. And then the null hypothesis is set to 0 0.11. And the alternative is set to less than. Then you click on compute. So let me do that. I'm going to do this step here. I'm going to go back to the lab and I'm going to go to question help and go to stat crunch. And in stat crunch, I'm going to go to stat proportion statistics, one sample with summary. I'll hold it there, John, so that you can just take a photo if you want or a snapshot. Okay. So after you click there, the number of successes is only 10. The number of observations is 183. The null hypothesis is 11% and the alternative is a less than.
So Mr. those are the four entries. So I'll wait there for an, uh, for a snapshot of that. Mr. Lakai, we can't see it. It's on the lab 10 still. Thank you. So let me try again, stat, proportion stats. One sample with summary. Okay. So that's the one shot. When you enter the software, then you put in how many people actually dropped and how many total people you observed. You change the null hypothesis and the alternative to their proper value and sign respectively. So that's what you're performing, the hypothesis test. So you do that. And then you just click on compute. And what you get is So the three stages are stat, proportion stats, one sample with summary. When you click on with summary, you get the, the box on the left. You enter those four values on the box on the left, and then you get, when you compute, you get the box on the right. Is that fully visible to everybody, John in particular? Yes. And does that make sense what I just did? Yep. Cool. So if you look on the bottom right-hand corner where it says Z stat, There, that's the test statistic. So what is the meaning of minus 2.39? That means that 10 drops in 183 yeah, students, like 10 drops in 193, oh, in 183 students, is 2.39 standard deviations below the believed rate of 11%. In other words, the difference between 11% and 5.4% in standard deviation units is 2.4 deviations below. What I'm seeing is 2.4 deviations below the average. This has a, so 10 drops in 183 students has less than 1% chance of occurring in a population where 11% of it, where 11% of students drop a class. In other words, it's nearly impossible that the data came from a theoretical population like the null hypothesis. So therefore you reject the null. And you favor the alternative. You favor this theory. Because the data is more consistent with the drop rate has really fallen. Okay, so I'll leave all those uh, positions there so that you can interpret these two results over here. And this all comes from SAT, proportion statistics, one sample with summary.
Okay, that has all four stages then. The command. Thank you for calling Penfields and Alchemy. What you put in. The command, what you put in and what you get out and how to interpret it. Is that good, John? Yes, actually my question is part B. <laughs> okay, so let's go into uh, the problem again. I'm at part B as well. We have to uh, compute the test statistic. 2.39. The p-value is uh, 0.008. Wait a minute. And then part. Alan, you're going too fast. I appreciate that, but these two numbers are the test statistic and the p-value. And I covered them very slowly in here. How in the prop summary did you? Let me get a get get a shot of this. Hold on, don't go yet. Don't take a shot yet. There. No. So that's the command sequence that I just activated with the white glove. Once that command sequence, once you click on with summary, so now you can take the whole picture. Once that you can, you click on with summary, this dialog window on the left opens and you put in these four, these four, these four data entries from your question. And when you compute that, you get this table, which gives you the test statistic and the p-value, which are the two numbers that I entered in the question. And then you have to interpret the results. And the results in this case lead you to conclude that the alternative theory is more aligned with the data than the null. So you reject the null in favor of the alternative, which means that you buy the software, that you should buy the software. because it's helping students not drop as much because fewer students drop. Okay, so that's how you use these two statistics and their interpretation to reach a conclusion. Does that make sense, John? So let's go to the question at hand again. So the test statistic is 2.39 negative, which means that the 5% of students who dropped in the data, only 10 students dropped out of 183. So that's a 5% drop rate. And when you compare that 5% drop rate to the 11% drop rate, the difference between the two is 2.4 standard deviations, which means there's less than a 1% chance that the null hypothesis is true. So therefore, instead of the null, we prefer the alternative. The alternative says that the percentage of students who drop is going down thanks to the software, because the software is the only thing that changes. So should the professor spend the money on the software? The answer is yes, because the p-value is less than the rejection probability. Okay, what is the rejection probability? The rejection probability is 5%. Did you see where that's at, Jim? It's in part A. They told you to use an alpha of 5%. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, So what you're comparing the 0 0.0083 is versus an alpha of, five percent. So the p-value is less than alpha.
And the conclusion of that is to reject the null because 0 0.008 is less than 0 0.05. So I think that was the part that was yet to be sort of more clear to you, right? When do you reject and when do you not reject? And we put that on board work number one. In purple down here. If the p-value is less than alpha, then we reject the null. So this is the Alan. This is how you. Um, bef before I answer your question, uh, Sam, this question was initiated by John. I want to make sure she gets it. We haven't even covered this in lecture. I know. And so it's... I'd rather take care of of her question, and then I'll answer your question. Is that okay? Sorry, I was just I was trying to follow along with this question as well. I understand, and and so does everybody. But but we haven't even covered this in lecture. This is something that she decided to go ahead on, to try to finish the class early. So I just want to make sure that the person, sorry, I, no no no, don't be sorry. The person who asks the question gets it, and then I'll t then I'll tackle everybody else's questions. Okay. So John, did you see where I got the part the answer to part D from? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Now Sam, what can I what part can I go over? I'm um I'm um I got the snapshot of your um of your hypothesis test and I'm doing everything I can to catch up. Um you're not catching up, you're ahead if you're doing this. It's um I'm you still at part B. I'm still at part B of that question. Okay, so if you're looking at my board work right now. Are you yes. on my board? Yes. The plan when you have a Chapter 10 question is called a hypothesis test about a proportion. The first thing you have to do is make sure you understand the four ingredients of the hypothesis test. Make sure you have data. I got a sure shot of that one. Make sure you have the null, the alternative, and, and the alpha. The alpha is the probability for reasonable doubt. So we described that at the beginning of the session when you were entering the session, these four steps right here. I got a shot of that board. Okay. So notice how after you get those four ingredients, you go to stat crunch and you input all these commands in purple at the top, stat, proportion, statistics, one sample with summary. And then you enter the value of the number of successes, the number of trials, and then you put the null and alternative hypothesis sign. Okay. And after that, you just compute and you get the test statistics. So this purple box, this purple box that I'm highlighting right now, that that's the sequence of commands that we covered in StatCrunch. And in this case, we had a problem where they gave us a bunch of information. They told us that the percentage of drops historically is 11%. They told us that uh, we are wondering if, uh, if the percentage could be lowered by using software in the class. And we're given data and we're told that the number of drops is 10 and that the sample size is 183. And then we're told that we should have a tolerance of, for reasonable doubt and that that tolerance should be 5%. And this was given to us in part A of the question. Right. It's not a part of the body of the problem. So I follow the command sequence and I did stat, proportion statistics. One sample example. proposition. We 
with summary. And that's what we, and this box is what, what opens when you do that. When you follow this stream of commands, you get this box. So notice how I entered the number of successes, 10. The number of observations, 183. The null hypothesis that P is 0.11. The alternative that P is less than 0.11. So once I put those four things, I compute. And when you compute, you get this box here. And what this box does is it calculates what is it that you saw as the percentage of drops in the sample that was using the software. And you see a 5.5% drop rate, which in standard deviation units translates into a test statistic of minus 2.39. And so that's part B, because part B in the problem asks you to figure out what is the test statistic. The p-value is also in the same set of computations. So all you have to do is go back to the computations and locate the p-value. And that's the last piece of information the software gives you. And that's part C. And then the question asks you to reach a conclusion. What do you get from, um, from this 0 0.008 p-value? What is the moral of your test, of the story that your hypothesis test tells you? Okay. And that's where we go back to our board work and we look at what we do as a last step. And as a last step, what we do is, if the p-value is smaller than alpha, which it is in this case, because 0 0.0083 is less than 5%, then we reject the null. The null mm -hmm. hypothesis is rejected. In other words, out of the two theories, out of these two theories, equals versus less than, the better of the two is less than. And so what that means is that the software seems to be working because the software seems to be lowering the rate of dropping based on the observed data. And so should I buy the software? Should the instructor buy the software? Yeah, because the p-value is less than alpha, which means that we reject the null and conclude that there is strong evidence that the dropout rate has fallen. And that fallen comes from this less than here. And the p-value means in the context? A p-value is the chance that the null hypothesis is true given the data we observe. So this is very similar to the calculation of the probability in the bicycle problem. Do you remember what the chances were that they finished the bike in less than 30 minutes? It was like 1%. So what did you infer from that 1%? That the store was not gonna be able to complete the bike in half an hour. So what do we mean by the p-value here being less than 1%? It means that there's less than 1% chance that the null hypothesis can be true based on the observations that we only see a percentage of 5.6% of drops, which is more than two standard deviations difference from the belief of 11%. Okay, so when we do all the math here, we figure out that the belief is that P is 11%. The data we 
means we observe only a 5.6% drop rate with software used. That's what the data says. There's an old saying, seeing is believing. By logic, this also means that uh, not seeing is not believing. One would say it's, it's not seeing isn't believing. It's actually the other way around. Believing is seeing. No, the, the, the saying goes, seeing is believing. And that also by logic means not seeing is not believing. That's just a logical construct. Okay. Or the, or the raised things in life are the things that we believe in are the things we can't see. That's called faith though. That's not called hypothesis testing. You can have faith, but that's different than hypothesis testing. Hmm. Again, this is a logical test that hypothesis test is based on. So this is a scientific method is based on seeing. The scientific method says seeing is believing and not seeing is not believing. I can't believe in what I do not see because seeing is believing. And uh, I think Francis Bacon wrote it that way in, I don't know, century 14 or something. Um, anyhow, the, um, so here we're, we're saying is the belief that P is 0.11 true? Contradicted by the observation that the sample proportion is uh, 0.05 six and the answer is yes because 0 0.056 is minus 2.39 standard deviations from 0 0.11 which implies that uh, there is 0 0.008 chance that the data could have come from a population with 11% drop. And that's not enough probability because we're giving ourselves only a 5% reasonable doubt chance. So we have less chance than reasonable. Reasonable would be the 5% alpha. I hope that clarifies things even more 
for those of you who are getting a little bit ahead and working through this chapter here. So do you see how we use Jan the p-value and the test statistic in the, in the thinking? Yeah. Okay. So that's how you would use it in question six. I think you also had question seven. Let me see if question seven is different enough to try. It says, uh, explain what your p-value means in this context. It's the chance of observing 10 or fewer dropouts and that's 0 0.0083, which is the same as 0.83 of 1%, less than 1%. Okay. So now let's look at problem seven. A company is willing to advertise, to renew its advertising with a radio station only if the station can convince them that more than 30% of residents have heard the ad and recognize the company product. Okay. The radio station uses a random survey of 600 people and 189 of them can remember the ad. So we have enough data, we have at least 10 people who remember the ad and at least 10 people who don't. 600 people is way less than 10% of the radio listenership probably. And it's a random phone poll. So all three conditions are met. The null hypothesis is that P equals 0.3 because the null always has an equal sign. And the alternative here is that more than 30% of people remember the ad because that comes from the more than 30% here. So we put that there. Let me know if I'm, um, if something is unclear as I go through. Hmm. So what is the test statistic? The test statistic is gonna compare what I, what should happen, what actually did happen in the sample. What happened in the sample is that 189 customers out of 600 remember the ad versus the null hypothesis in units of standard deviation. And I'll cover this in lecture this week when I cover chapter 10. But you don't have to remember these numbers because this is calculated from stat calc uh, proportion statistics one sample with data, sorry, with summary. So that's where it comes from. Then you click on, you enter the data and you do compute and you get that. Okay, so I'm going by, back to Stat Crunch. I go stat, proportion stats, one sample with summary. Number of successes is 189 people. Those are the 189 people who remember the ad. 600 is the sample size. Stat, proportion statistics, one sample with summary. So it's 189 out of 600. The proportion is 30% versus more than 
And so this is the test statistic and this is the p-value. Test statistic is 0.8. So this whole mess is uh, 0 0.8. Wait a minute, Alan. I was almost I was almost close to getting that uh that summary down. It is this does the nine does the point nine five always stay? Can you repeat your question? Does the point nine five in the summary stat always stay the way it is, or do we just do the hypothesis test, not confidence interval? We're not doing confidence intervals yet. We're not doing, this is chapter nine, by the way. Hmm. This is chapter 10. So the same command will be used in both chapters. Oh, okay. But we're not doing anything having to do with confidence interval. We're just performing a hypothesis test. So all you need is the null and the alternative sign and the data uh, for sample size and success. And once you compute from there, you get the test statistic and the p-value in the problem. And once you get the test statistic, you just interpret it as the difference between what you see in the data, which is 0.315, and what you believe in the null hypothesis, which is the 0.3. And 0.315 and 0.3 are very close to each other statistically. They're within one deviation of each other. They're within one standard deviation of each other. And that's why when they're within one deviation of each other, there's a very high chance 21% is the p-value. Since the p-value is greater than 5%, we don't reject the null, which means there is not enough evidence that more than 30% of people remember the ad. So the company should not renew the contract with the radio station because you shouldn't be paying for advertising that's not giving you results in terms of better brand awareness or more people recognizing the brand by the radio. Huh. Okay. So did that make sense, John? That problem seven yes. was an example. Yeah. Okay. Problem seven was an example of the p-value in that case was bigger than alpha. 0.21 was bigger than 0.05. So you don't reject the null. And then you state what not rejecting the null means in the context of the question. Okay. So if you look at lab 10, question seven. Part B. And then explain what your p-value means. It means that there's a 21% chance that 189 or more people will remember the ad. Sorry, or fewer people will remember the ad. Or more people will remember the ad. So 
So that's why you go with the alternative, which is that there's not enough evidence that that's that 21% is not enough evidence compared to that 5%. Okay. So let me go back to the board and just set it up. Okay. So every hypothesis test has four parts. You have a data component, you have a null hypothesis, you have an alternative hypothesis, and you have a level of reasonableness, a level of reasonable doubt. After 10 calls at a level of significance, So the data says that you see 189 people remembering the ad. The null hypothesis says that the percentage of people who see the ad and remember it should be less than or equal to 30%. The alternative says more than 30%. And the level of significance is 5%. In addition, you know that you're studying 600 people at random. So the percentage of people here is 31.5%. Uh, this is what we call sample proportion. So when you compare these two, the, what you see versus what you believe, when you compare those two, you get a test statistic result. And they are 0 0.8 standard deviations apart. In other words, the test statistic is 0 0.8. And when you notice that this is called a right tail test because the Focus or emphasis is on the greater than side of the test. That translates into a probability. This test statistic translates into a p-value of 21%. So there is a 21% chance that 0.315 was observed in a sample of 600 people when the population percentage is actually 0.3. And last, the alpha gets compared to the p-value and the p-value is bigger. So the chance in favor of the null, which is the p-value, is larger than the chance against the null.
So we keep the null hypothesis. That's our belief. Does that make sense? Should I get a shot of this? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do a few more boxes here. We have data, which is what we see. We have the null, which is what we believe. We compare what we see to what we believe. And when we compare what we see to what we believe, we get the test statistic. And when we combine the test statistic with the where the test is challenging the null hypothesis, we get the p-value. And then we last compare the p-value to the level of reasonable doubt in our model to get our conclusion. Does that make sense? So that's how the structure of reasoning through hypothesis testing works. Seeing versus believing gives us a statistical distance. That statistical distance in standard deviations gets translated into a probability in favor of the null. And that probability gets compared to our probability against the null that we choose and that we preset prior to the data collection so that there's no conflict of interest in the data collection. And then we just reach a conclusion by the comparison of p-value and alpha. So now let me go back to um, exam three. Okay, I'm gonna go back to exam three. On randomness. Probability, probability models, and the role of exam three was to basically give you the tools necessary to move to exam four and have a probability model as the framework where you think through the uncertainties and where you think about whether you should believe in some theory or not believe in some theory. And most of your questions on exam three are 11, nine, 11 and nine, and seven. Seven, nine, and 11. Um, uh, yes, Carmen? Oh, so, um, cause I see on the exam three there, like when you click on the right side corner, there's like a tick, like real an example. So I think those questions, like it's easily to understand by myself, but there are some questions like multiple choice that I don't understand the concept. So that's why I just ask for those questions. Okay. So we're looking at now at, um, we're going back to exam three. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sort of, I'm, I'm sorry it's taking a while. I'm just loading exam three now. It's all right. It's okay. Thank you. And I think somebody just now had asked for number six. Okay, thank you. I think it was JT. Okay, so first question three. Then question six, then question nine, and then just question 11. So in question three, that's a question from chapter five. And so the important thing there is to notice how there's a table and the table has on the interior what are called joint probabilities. Joint probabilities are like the probability of yes and shop, yes and under 20. Yes and under 20 would be 18% but the 24% would mean the probability that someone is under 20, so that's 24. Those are called marginal probabilities, those three at the far right. And the two at the far bottom are called marginal probabilities as well, but they have to do with whether people shop or not. Okay, and by the rule of complements, all of the marginals have to add up to the whole story. Otherwise, you don't have a probability model because you haven't taken into account everything. And this six probabilities are probabilities called joint probabilities because they have two characteristics. So when it says here, what is the probability that a survey respondent will shop at the new store? So this is the probability that the variable uh, shop equals yes. So that's just 0.57. What is the probability that a survey respondent will shop given that they are younger than 20? That's called a conditional probability. So in a conditional probability, you need to apply the conditional rule of probability, which is different than the marginal rule of probability. In this case, you need to calculate the probability of both parts and divide that by the probability that the age of the person is under 20. So you need to do a marginal calculation divided by uh, sorry, you need to do a joint probability calculation and divide the joint probability by a marginal probability. So in this case, the marginal probability is that a person is under 20. So that is 0.24. And the probability that a person is shopping in under 20 is 18. So I get the 18 from the interior of the table here. And then when I do the math, 18 divided by 24 is 75%. What is the probability that a survey respondent who is older than 40, who is older than 40, shops at the store? So, so this is a probability that shop equals yes. And age is over 40. No. 
we know that the respondent is already over 40. So this is not an and, this is a given. So the, the way you determine whether you're looking at a joint or at a conditional probability is the language subtleties. And you find the language subtleties around the verb of the question. So the verb here is shops. And you know that a survey respondent is older than 40, that's given. Okay, so that once again is a conditional probability. So that once again is this vertical line. And so I need to, I need to divide the joint probability that someone is older and shopping by the probability that they're over 40. And notice how when people are young, their tendency is to shop a lot. And as people get older, their tendency is to shop less. So the two factors, age and shopping, are called dependent factors because the probability of shopping depends on the age and vice versa. Last question is, what is the probability that a survey respondent is younger than 20 or will shop at the store? So now this probability is the probability that someone shops or is younger than 20. So this is called an addition rule because of the or. So the or makes this a sum. So I have to take everybody who is under 20 and add it to everybody who is a shopper. And I have to be careful not to double count people who are double counted, who are in both groups. So I apply the addition rule of probability to that. I get the answer. Okay, so that's question three. Is there any question about that, Carmen? Nope. Okay, so it depends. So in chapter five, we learn nine rules of probability, and it's about applying the nine rules. I think I didn't ask for a, um, number three. I think I asked okay. for number nine. Yeah, so probably okay. that was for me. Cool. So let me do six then. Okay, that's great. So six is from chapter six. Let's go. The first three questions are from chapter five. The next four questions are for chapter six. And in chapter six, we learned about probability models. Okay, so I'm gonna take this question and move it to our board. Okay, so I'm supposing that a computer chip manufacturer rejects 5% of the chips produced because they fail testing. And then the first question is asking us to measure uh, the probability that the third chip is the first bad one. The second question The second question is asking us for the probability that they find a bad one within the first nine.
The third one is that they find the first bad one is the fifth one. And the first bad one is the one of the first six. So all these questions are what we call geometric counts. It's uh, how many times you try something until you observe but you are interested in counting. For the first time. And so that's the key. That's the key to the language in talking about talking about something happening for the first time. So in the first part, you're looking for x to be 3. In the second part, you're looking for x to be one of the first nine. The third one is that the first chip is the fifth one. The fourth question is that the first bad chip is one of the first six ones. And in all cases, the probability that a chip is bad is 0.05. And so then in each of these questions, what we're going to do is we're going to go to stat, calculators, geometric, number of trials, and then when the calculator opens, we will input N and P as desired. I mean P, P and X as desired. So, so we're going to set P equals to 0 0.05, and then vary X according to each to each part of the problem. So let me go back to Stack Crunch. And I'm going to go stat, calculators, geometric, number of trials. And in each calculator that I, each calculation I take care of, So we need four of them? I'm just going to solve them all in one shot. We don't need four. We can just open one. It's and, better. Okay. And, but this is uh, nice because then you can just take a picture of this and see the four calculations in one picture. Got it. So it's the same calculator as you can see. And in each part, you are setting P to 0, 0.5 because 
That's the probability of failure of a chip. And that's what we're looking for, what percentage of chips fail. And then in each question, the questions were, the first bad one is the third chip. So we change this to an equals. The second is that the first bad one is one of the first nine. Then the first bad one is the fifth chip. And the uh, first bad one is one of the first six. So those are the four answers to, to your question. And I hope you can just take a shot of that. So remember the probability that we used is the percentage of defective chips. And then X is number of trials until first defective chip. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep, 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 yep. We'll leave it, leave it there for a shot. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. So now I'm moving on to I'm going to set up a new sheet for the next problem. The next problem I think you wanted to observe was problem problem nine. Yep, this is my question. Ah, okay. So I'm gonna copy this on the board. This is exam three, and this is uh, question nine. So here we have the, I'm gonna use green for money. And this money is going to be the price of a stock. And we're going to set a parallel line. And this line is going to be in standard deviation units. And then they tell you that the mean price the mean price of the stock over the last year has been seventy two dollars. So I'm going to do put seventy two right around the middle. And that means that this is close to zero. In, well, it is the zero z-score location because that's the average, right? So far, so good. Yes. We also talked about how one deviation is referred to as common. So I'm gonna put a kind of like an easy blue around that. So if I go one deviation right, and one deviation left. That range is what we would call the usual.
because it's within one deviation of the mean. Mm -hmm. Now, which of these three choices is more likely to be a standard deviation? I claim that, that just looking at the usual prices being one deviation, that 60 can't be right because it's too big. Too much, yeah. too much deviation. Because if, if 60 were the deviation, mm -hmm. then this, this point here would be a 12. And then- what um. And then you would see a negative price really mm. commonly. And it's impossible to see negative stock prices. Okay. Now it leaves us with a 50-50 chance between 6 and 26. Is 6 too little or, or is 26 also too much? So here's what's happening there. A stock price... is a number that is greater than, but not smaller than? One? Zero. Oh, zero. You can't have something, because zero means, zero dollars means that the company is worth nothing. And there's no way that a company can be worth less than nothing. It can only be worth nothing at the, at the, in the worst case scenario. So companies cannot be worth, people who own companies cannot have the company be worth less than zero. That's called, um, this is called the limited liability of assets. So no publicly traded firm can be worth less than zero dollars. You might have heard a story a couple of weeks ago that said that the price of oil went into negative territory. Oil is not a company. Oil is a commodity, it's a good. So some commodities could be sold at a negative price into the future. For example, let's say that I'm a city and I produce garbage my citizens produce garbage every day. The price of garbage is actually a negative price because it's not a good, it's a bad. And so what the city does is it tries to find where to put the garbage. And usually you put them in waste sites. And waste sites are places where you exercise the right to drop garbage in. And in exchange for that, you pay the waste side money exactly so you're paying a negative price so you're paying the negative price of garbage but garbage is not a company either garbage is a commodity it's a good or a service companies cannot be worth less than zero even if goods are worth less than zero companies cannot be worth less than zero so that's an important distinction so i know that zero is sort of my limit here because goods can can come free but companies cannot be bought for free correct because property rights have value and if they don't have value then it's not a real property so zero is going to be kind of like our limit here so 60 is too big now 26 i claim may be too big also Why is that? Well, think about it. If I go in chunks of 26, if 26 chunks, is half of 72, right? So if you did no, that, it. No, it's not. 26 is not half of 72, 36. So if I go two deviations, that's $52 less. That puts me at a $20 point here. But if I try to go a third deviation, 
if I try to go a third deviation, then I go into negative territory and that's not possible. And it is possible for a z-score to be between two and three. It's kind of very unusual, but it can happen. And so that means that the only possible value that is correct is six. In addition, there's another key in the language of the question that I don't expect you guys to have figured it out, which is that this is something called a blue chip stock. What is a blue chip stock? It's a stock from a very large company that's well established. Okay. So a blue chip stock is the stock of, of a very well established large company. which tend to be companies with little price fluctuation. In other words, they are safe companies to invest in. And what is a safe company? It's a company with a low standard deviation. So that made sense, Carmen. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I hope it makes sense to all of you as well. Yes, it does. And now 11. 11 is a question about the police doing oh, something. Yeah, I think. You already uploaded it. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I'll do it again. It's no big deal. It's on the list, so. Mm -hmm. Exam three, question 11. So usually if you see a driver, a driver does one of two things. When they're driving, They can either be wearing their seat belt or not wearing the seat belt. And it says here that 88% of people wear their seat belt, which means that 12% of people don't. And then what I'm trying to answer in this question is what is the probability that the police stop 140 cars and then they find at least 12 drivers not wearing their seat belt? So since we're talking about drivers who are not wearing their seat belt, not wearing is what we're looking for. And that means that this is what we're gonna call P. This is what we're gonna call Q. And that the number of actual models of this kind that we study is uh, 140. And what we are counting is the number of drivers not wearing seat belts. And that kind of account is in a group of 140 drivers. And that is called a binomial model of counting. So X is a binomial count. And uh, what we are trying to do is we're going to use a normal model to 
to estimate that. So to, to do a normal calculation, I'm going to need the mean and the standard deviation. So step one, when you use a normal approximation, step one is calculate the mean and the standard deviation. And then step two is going to be run the normal calculator. and set the mean and the standard deviation to the values in step one. And then set the probability to x being greater than or equals to 12. And then click on compute to get the answer. And so those are the two steps. So what are, what are the mean and the standard deviations in a binomial? The mean is the expected value of x, which is n times p. The variance is n times p times q. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So that's what we're going to do first. And then second, we're just going to run the normal calculator and find out the probabilities they're in. So let me go for a moment back to StatCrunch. And the format that I've been setting up for normal approximations to binomial problems is I put n, p, and q up on the labels. And then I set the values. In my problem, 88% of drivers wear their seat belts. 12% don't out of 140. So the first thing I'll do is data compute expression. I'm going to do multiple expressions at once so that I can do the calculations for mean, variance, and standard deviation. And I'm going to just put the formulas in. So those are the three formulas for the mean variance and standard deviation. And those we compute these expressions a lot, don't we, Alan? Well, they're the same inputs in our thinking, right? So there's the mean and there's a standard deviation and then we just go stat calculators normal. And there's your answer. There's an 89% chance of that. So again, the um, First, you compute the multiple expressions there, the mean, the variance, and the deviation. Once you have the, the mean and the standard deviation, you plug those into StatCrunch normal calculator and the question, and you get the answer.
So it's going to be very easy to find at least 12 people in that big of a group of drivers. Any questions about the answer or the... No. Okay. Alan, did you have the... Uh... Did you have the normal calculator set to greater than or equal to or less than or equal to? The question here is, what is the probability that they find at least 12 drivers? So this answer came from calculating that. And to do this, I needed to go stat calculators normal and set the mean to n times p and uh, set the standard deviation to the square root of n times p times q. And then set um, x to be greater than or equals in the standard mode. And the reason I got this this mean and this and this standard deviation and these formulas is because the problem originally is set up as a binomial problem. Could you bring up your stat crunch if you if it you still got it? Yeah, please. Oh. So I did two command sequences. The first command sequence is called data compute multiple expressions and that's this box here with these three calculations and the goal here is to get the mean and to get the standard deviation that I use mm -hmm in the normal model in step two. So that's step one. Step two is Stat calculators normal. And what and the goal there is to calculate the probability of X being at least twelve. So for that I set the mean to 16.8, set the standard deviation to 3.84, and I set x to greater than or equals to 12. And that's what gives me the 0.894. So now you can take a shot of that if you want. Because that's how you solve every binomial, by the way. And there are lots of binomials in lab seven and in quiz seven. Okay. The other setup that we use a lot in lab seven and quiz seven and in exam three is the compound model, like the bicycle problem, the coffee and donut problem, the swimmers problem, the bowl of cereal problem. All those are compound models.
And then in the binomial, we have the vitamin D question in children, the, um, this one, the, the identifying drivers without a seatbelt on, the tossing a coin and finding out if a coin is fair or not, doing a survey and finding out, you know, so, um, so those were heavily reused uh, types of questions. Any other questions? Uh, I think I ran out of questions that you guys asked me about. Um, yeah, Ellie. Uh, oh, you can go first. Oh, no, you, you go first, actually. That's okay, Pani. Let's do this. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, can we do uh, question one as well? Yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> yeah. One, uh, the exam? Yep. Yeah, same exam. Question one. Okay, so question one was about life in about hot housing, home insurance, fire insurance. So I'm going to pose the question in a really common sense way. Would you rather buy home insurance from a, a, an insurance company or from me? Um, um, I don't mind. The company, right? Yeah. Because if I knock on your door and I say, hey, give me 300 bucks. And if anything goes down with respect to your house, having a fire and burning out. I'll replace your house. And let's say you have a million dollar house, which is average in the Bay Area. Okay. You're giving me 300 bucks and I'm supposed to replace your house worth a million if your house burns down. Do you see anything wrong with that? Mm -mm. See, I'm, I'm not collecting 300 bucks from everybody. I'm just collecting it from one person from you. Mm-hmm. So I'm taking a lot of risk if we're playing a lottery where you get coverage from me and only from me. Because mm -hmm. if your house burns down, mm -hmm. all I have to help you restore it is the 300 you gave me. Mm -hmm. and I have to come up with $998,700 on my own. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's risky. so it's super risky. So that's a high high variance, high deviation. Oh, okay. So the answer is um it would be foolish to insure one's neighbor house for three hundreds, right? It would be foolish to insure a neighbor's house because although one mm -hmm. would probably collect three, in other words, chances are I'll keep the 300 bucks because mm -hmm. chances are your house won't burn down because mm -hmm. there's a very low chance that any house burns down. Mm -hmm. But if your house does burn down, there's no way I can pay you back. All right. And so that's where the high de standard deviation comes from. It's a super high standard deviation problem. So I guess it's um, A, or it would be foolish. Insurance. In my case, yeah, it would be foolish. But what is what makes the insurance company able to offer that and not seem so foolish? Oh wait, Ellen, we can't see your um, yeah, uh, your screen for the question. Yep, here you go. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah, the risk is not worth it. The risk is. But uh. Um, B for me. In other words, it's the law of large numbers. That's what you, we learned in chapter five as the law of large numbers. The reason why insurance companies can do what they do for a living, let's say your auto insurance. For me, the answer would be B and C. Yeah. It would be foolish and 
not worth the 300 and insures many people. People. Right. Yeah. Because what happens with auto insurance, for example, is we all pay auto insurance. But we don't all get into car accidents all the time. Yeah, but but sometimes even when you do, you don't like call for your insurance because you end up paying for all your damage for your car sometimes. Well, that could be the true or it could be <laughs> an irrational insecurity about the insurance company being shady. In which yeah. case you shouldn't have a shady insurance company. You should have an insurance company you can trust which is why the commercials in the auto insurance world are all about how you should trust them. Mm -hmm. Right. And they give you good drivers discounts and all this stuff. And there's the question who pays for good driver discounts? The answer is bad drivers. Oh, and who are the bad drivers? Well, it doesn't have to be that you're a quote unquote bad driver because you're bad at driving. You could be a bad driver because you get into a lot of accidents or people hit you a lot. Mm -hmm. And so you're magnetic to other cars. You know? Or because you're drunk. Well, in that case, you're not going to have car insurance either because nobody insures people uh, who have the car that has repeated instances of driving under the influence. I mean, one driver driving under the influence, I think they cancel your license for like 12 months or something like that. So if they cancel your license, you can't even get insurance for a year because nobody would insure you because they'd be stupid to insure you. That's true. So mm -hmm. when you go through a DUI, there are a lot of consequences beyond just the, the fact that you are endangering other people's lives in, on the road by driving without, your, you know, without the possession of all your... So JT, I, I noticed that you may not have been here when we covered your your question, which I think was this binomial question, question six. No, yeah, I was here. I got it. I just didn't say anything. Okay. So but, here yeah, are the uh, so here are the four pictures in case you haven't you want to take a shot at it of the pictures and stuff. So this was uh, exam three, question six. And um, <coughs> good. So we've covered everything on the list here. Um, anything else that you'd like to cover? Um, I just had a question. When would be our um, next Zoom meeting that we can just, just like today, just kind of ask you the questions because it was really next helpful. Week, next yesterday. week our schedule goes back to normal. So I'll be open for questions from 1 to 4 p.m. Monday through Thursday. One till four, okay. Yeah, I'll send you guys the invite to the one to four again. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, I'll also- um, awesome. you're welcome. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Absolutely, you guys are welcome. The other thing is I'm gonna be extending exam three by a few days upon a request by some folks who think they can do one take by May 5th, but not finish both takes by May 5th. So I'll extend it a little bit. Okay. The, uh, the third part I wanted to mention is definitely definitely take the extra credit because it's worth the 200 points, the chapter eight extra credit that I put in the announcement section of Canvas. Um, just exam three, so lab seven and quiz seven and everything else. I'll also else do those. Just, I won't do six or five, but I'll do seven. seven. And I'll extend okay. seven for, to like the end of the week. But uh, in terms of lecture time tomorrow oh. and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, we have to get into chapters nine and 10. So we're gonna cover chapters nine and 10 in this coming week. Sure. And then next week we cover chapter 11 and maybe 14. Um, and that puts us at the end of the semester, May 15th. And then May 22nd is when I'll close the canvas. Okay. Um, Alan, the day for closing canvas again? May 22, I think, May 20. 21, 22, before Memorial Day weekend. Yes, Carmen, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, I just wanted to ask, like, for an extra credit assignment, we just email it to you? That's correct. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Okay, guys, have a great Sunday. I know you're working hard, and I'm going to go hardly working now and uh, take a break.
Thank you, Mr. Lakaya. We really Thank appreciate you so it. Much. Really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks very yeah. much, Alan. Thank you. Deeply appreciated.